here. Well, welcome to the uh, second of the 2024 Dubai lectures. Um, uh, Peter Dubai was an important uh, figure in this department and had an interesting uh, uh, career that the department involved itself in uh, uh, fairly lately, actually. Dubai received his degree in electrical engineering at the turn of the last century and uh, got his PhD involved in understanding radiation pressure, which was basically coming up with a new way of uh, finding Planck's equation. Uh, and then uh, went into academics at this point in general, sort of hopped around following Einstein when Einstein would leave a position that would be filled with him by Peter Dubai. During this period, he studied all kinds of uh, physical interactions, mostly with um, um, electromagnetism and charges in solution. We're well familiar to, with the uh, with the uh, the Dubai as a measure of a dipole moment and uh, Dubai Huckle theory as a measure of trying to figure out stuff in solutions. Um, so he was really sort of a, a grassroots uh, um, scientist in all kinds of physical chemistry back in the day. And of course, engineering and chemistry and physics were kind of blurred. They're not sort of chopped into the pieces that we find them in the university today. Uh, he was clearly a huge figure in the field at this time and eventually uh, was named the director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. He was president of the Deutsche Physikalische, uh, I think it's the Lokalische Gesellschaft. Um, at this point in time, um, uh, Start the war started. And uh, at the time, he also received the Lorenz Prize, it was a major uh, prize given by the G. GP, the GP, whatever the hell it is. And uh, I didn't know much about the history of Dubai, but we were all assaulted by the history of Dubai many, many years later when a letter or a book was written. Um, where um, so I would be here my reading list is up because it's rolled and I know it's a, it's a difficult time of life. <laughs> yeah. We had to go spy with the meeting us. It was, um, I want to do this quote here. Uh, In the controversy, was a book that came out that said that the Bible was a Nazi sympathizer <laughs> on the basis largely of the letter in which he wrote, in light of the current situation, membership by German Jews is stipulated by the Nuremberg laws of the Deutsche Philokalische Gesellschaft cannot be continued. According to the board, I asked all members to whom these definitions apply to report to me their resignation by the letter. So um, this um, was taken by the Deutsch uh, the Dutch author as being a uh, 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 very damning sort of um, conclusion that the Bible was a Nazi sympathizer at the time. Um, and uh, when this came out, this department actually met for, good God, roughly 10 hours in three meetings. And we called in our own historians to sort of deal with this because we had to divide the bust of Peter Dubai in the, in the foyer. I don't know if it's there where we moved it out of conscious or not. And um, we had this lecture that was made after it. So we had to decide whether to continue on with this or to uh, uh, to uh, uh, remove the, remove his name. So, and it was after a long deliberation that we came to uh, that um, there wasn't enough concrete evidence to remove the name or to Include that he was not a sympathizer. In fact, there were scholars that came in who basically said, well, you know, what might be happening is that he was basically towing the line to uh, keep whatever Jewish people were on the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for as long as possible before, uh, before having to get rid of them. And him staying in this position actually may have actually helped them in some regard. So, is there controversial sort of thought? But at the time, his name was removed from a couple of institutes in Europe um, and was removed from lectureships in Europe and so forth. And there became a backlash, actually, to this book to some extent. And um, interviews with his son, for example, basically said his father was completely apolitical. And if you can imagine, this is someone who was 
described as a scientist who is science above all else. So the, no politics mattered whatsoever. What only mattered was how our science could be furthered under, under whatever, uh, what political situation there was. Now, I can imagine the choice of you know, being a Nazi or not. I think that's probably not the greatest state hypothesis that you should have. Uh, so I think we can look upon him with a bit of giant side in, in our department, actually. We, the department as a whole voted to uh, retain the, the name, um, but there were a few dissenters uh, at the time. So it's not, it was a perfect conclusion. And gradually, as more and more people sort of, uh, there was a backlash to these changes that occurred in Europe. Uh, uh, the, his name on the Institute of the University of Light has been raised reconstituted and so forth. And there's been a couple of um, fairly large panels basically convened to look into the history of this. And um, uh, they all conclude basically that the bio was certainly was somebody who profited from academics and would profit from any political situation. That seemed to be the case. But I think the probably the best sort of um, reasoning that came uh, came to the front uh, was that the committees that were formed post-war uh, awarded him a huge prize um, as a result of um, both his scientific work and likely maybe some of his political work, and that some of the greatest critics of the Nazi regimes were also, did not complain. They were in favor of the award that the award was granted. So I think that the worst, uh, certainly the worst we can think about Devine is he was sick. He was a profiteer in some respect. This department, uh, he came over to give the Baker lectures in 1939, but I believe stayed as a result of that. He was offered a position here. Satan was a member of the department for a number of years and was our chair for uh, a number of years as well. So um, that's sort of the history of it. And so we still have a statement on these letters. And so, Don, now you can. I'm talking about your checker career. <laughs> <laughs> should, uh, uh, I was going to give us a little different sort of a uh, glimpse of uh, organometallic uh, chemistry in action today. And uh, we just wanted to re uh, remember that Don was also recently elected to the National Academy of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And so um, uh, we're glad to have him here as our Peter Devine lecturer. Of course, you Don, take it away. Thank you, Peter. Um, okay, how do I start this? Oh. So uh, I want to thank uh, Pete for that introduction. I, I didn't know about that history with, with Dubai, but uh, I, uh, for one, I'm glad that this lectureship has continued to and uh, we it would be the and you used to, to uh, celebrate chemistry, really. Uh, and I, and I want to extend my heartfelt uh, thanks to all, all of you who have I've interacted with over the past couple of days. It's been a very fast and fun time here. I've really enjoyed it. Special thanks to uh, Heather and Debica who uh, showed me around and uh, all the students I've, I've been able to talk to and, and have interesting discussions with. So thanks a lot for having me here. I'll, I'll always remember this as a, as a great time. So what I want to uh, talk about today is a project that uh, is really close to my heart because it really started in, in a classic uh, uh, academic kind of way. Really, I, I remember the origin of this project as a group meeting where we were discussing a particular kind of reaction. And uh, I'll just go ahead and show you. thought I was going to go ahead and show you. Uh, this reaction, which is uh, illustrated here in a general way. And this is the reaction that we use as a workhorse to do uh, chemistry in, in this area we now refer to as our nanocarbon project. But the idea re really in the, in, uh, at that group meeting where this came up was not really uh, about nanocarbons per se, but really more about conjugated polymers. We were doing conjugated polymer research at the time, looking at polysilanes and polysilanes and sigma conjugation. But we were in general interested in, in conducting polymers and what they could do and new routes to control properties. 
And uh, a student was giving a literature overview of uh, this kind of, of coupling of two alkynes, which is a very powerful way to make a carbon-carbon bond and make heterocycles that oftentimes you can then convert into other uh, ring uh, compounds, arenes, and, and also I'll show you on the next slide, I think, lots of other structures. And this is a reaction that works for a lot of metals across the periodic table, but we have focused on zirconium and uh, somewhat with more with iridium uh, of late, and I'll, I'll describe that later. But uh, a more recent version of this reaction, which works differently and in many ways a lot better in terms of efficiency, is uh, the coupling of tethered diines. And our interest here was originally in the fact that we realized if we have a tethered diine like this, and we cyclize, then we introduce in one reaction two rings at once. So that was the appeal initially that got us going in that direction. Okay. Right, so how do you make a polymer? This is something we started to talk about at the group meeting. Uh, I posed the question, okay, it makes a carbon-carbon bond. Could you use this reaction, which generates a more extended pi structure when you do when you make that carbon carbon bond to conducting polymers and we quickly uh, realized that we could we could do such a thing if we had a rigid spacer in a diene like this because then you can't get intramolecular coupling of the alkynes and that has to happen intermolecularly so that that was the idea and it was based on a lot of really nice conosine coupling chemistry that had been reported initially by Fagan and, and Nugent and DuPont, but then followed up very nicely in terms of methodology development and organic synthesis by Buckwald, Nagishi, uh, Takahashi, and others. And you see how it works here. You generate zirconosine in solution from zirconosine dichloride. It's a very uh, convenient uh, reagent, zirconosine dichloride plus n-butyl lithium, that generates mainly the species that you see here with two good leaving groups. And so that's a synthon for zirconosine, which itself is, is not stable, of course. And then you can see a uh, reductive coupling of alkynes to give first this metallocycle. And then there's a lot of chemistry you can do with the zirconium carbon bonds to elaborate that structure in different directions. And that was the idea behind making conducting polymers. We thought that this would be introduce a modular way to vary the properties of a conducting uh, unsaturated polymer. And so the first monomer we thought of is the one you see down here on the left. And the student in my group at the time, this goes back to uh, days at UC San Diego, was Shane Mao. And he started uh, doing this chemistry the next day. And uh, you see the result of that here. One thing we didn't anticipate was that the coupling is not regioselective. So you get a lot of cross coupling in the polymer, which gives you a little bit higher band gap, which is kind of interesting as it turns out. These, uh, a lot of these polymers are blue light emitting. And that's one of the property we, properties we were looking at at the time. But control of regiochemistry became one of the uh, main things we, we focused on resolving. And it turns out there are several ways to do that. So this is a great way to make polymers uh, that, are, that are conductive and have different kinds of uh, chromophores embedded in them. One of the early ways we came up with was uh, developed by Brett Luck, who was a postdoc in the group, and he was a student from here. He was in Dave Collins' lab and, and came to my lab to work on this project. And you see his approach here. It's to uh, use a flexible linker between the diion units and adding zirconosine. And this is just trivial conversion to the diene, but surprisingly, this is a very selective reaction. So zirconosine only couples neighboring alkynes. We can tell that by uh, exhaustive characterization of, of uh, those polymers. Well, another observation made right off the bat by, by Shane was that if silicon is a, is a substituent in the alkyne, either terminally or, or internally like this, then you can make a polymer kinetically, but even light heating, uh, and this, this we found out by just trying to, to purify this polymer, uh, leads to a very 
high yielding depolymerization to a macrocycle. So this is a, a reaction that's driven by entropy. It's an example of dynamic covalent chemistry. You're familiar with that process. So this is a, a way to uh, a way in which thermodynamics guides the synthesis to one uh, product. And you can see that by GPC traces over here to the right. There is a solvent dependence to this, but what's happening is that we're forming a carbon-carbon bond reversibly. And I'll, I'll hit on that theme a few times going forward and making use of that dynamic covalent uh, chemistry to do supramolecular chemistry using carbon-carbon bonds. Uh, one nice thing about this is that once you form the structure using the zirconium in that reversible carbon-carbon bond formation, if you just hydrolyze, then you have a very stable uh, carbon-based, mostly carbon-based uh, macrocycle. So this is what's happening. The, the depolymerization is a, is a low energy process. So I'm gonna talk about zirconosine coupling really in two formats. And so I've already introduced them, but just to reemphasize, we're gonna talk about alkyne coupling uh, to give metallocycles that we then elaborate in different ways. So this is an efficient way to do ring fusions, and that's how we use that reaction. And then the reversibility that I just referred to, the dynamic covalent chemistry we use to make macrocycles, rings, and larger structures. So you can imagine that the macrocycle here uh, will really be defined by the linking group. And you can make this pretty big, pretty long. And the reaction is still pretty high yielding. So more recently, our motivation has to do with systems that have many fused rings. And a lot of the properties that have attracted interest have to do with allotropes of carbon and the properties that have been identified for uh, those allotropes, things like C60 and, and nanotubes and, and graphene. And it's easy to imagine cutouts of these structures that would also be very interesting, have the same kind of properties, but be uh, maybe species that you could introduce into a device or utilize in a, in, uh, a chemical or, or uh, device-oriented fashion. So nano belts, for example, uh, nano ribbons, uh, bucky bowls. These have been synthetic targets for a lot of people. The, the issue, of course, is how do you fuse so many rings together in a selective way to make those kinds of structures? So ring fusions have, have really been, uh, been synthetic, uh, represent the synthetic difficulty of making some of these structures. And then you can imagine other structures not known in nature that would also be interesting if you had a way to add uh, fused rings one onto the other in a selective and efficient and, and scalable way. So for example, helical structures like this, uh, helical graphenes have, have been of interest. And of course here, a part of the interest is in the optical properties of these kind of systems, but they should also be graphene-like in terms of their ability to uh, tra transport charge. Negatively carved nanocarbons have, have been of interest, you know, so inserting other sized rings into the structure, that would be of interest. Or making large fused macrocycles that uh, are actually, ha actually have aromatic character, globally aromatic. So lots of space to venture into if you have efficient synthetic methods for um, fusing rings. I'm going to begin by talking, uh, describing for you a little bit of what we've done in methodology development. So with this uh, metallocycle uh, formation, we then want to do subsequent uh, chemistry. And I'll show you just a, a few things we've done that I think are pretty useful in that regard. One has to do with uh, making thiophenes, thiophene oxides, using just SO2 as the reagent. So we generate zirconosine. This one is functionalized because we were making a polymer. But from here, you can quantitatively just add SO2 and make this uh, thiophene monooxide. This is a way to make sulfoxanes and uh, a lot of things that have th this kind of sulfur-based five-membered ring in a polymeric structure. 
We have relatively recently found how to extend this chemistry to include nitrogen in the ring. There's a lot of interest in that and in, in graphene and, and fused ring systems, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, because nitrogen does several things. It changes the electronic properties, of course. Um, it it uh, leads to a lot of the catalysts that are being developed uh, by supporting catalysts on graphene after they've been doped with nitrogen. So we'd like to make in a controlled way structures that have those nitrogens. And so something we'd wanted to do for a long time is include nitriles into that coupling chemistry. And uh, we were able to do that by linking them in a, in, to a biera like this. This was chemistry developed by Gavin Keel. He's really the, the, the founding student of a lot of the newer nanocarbon chemistry that I'll talk about. And his undergrad, uh, Adrian Samkian, who's now a grad student at Caltech. You see some of the things we can do with this coupling reaction. I think the coolest thing is that after, I didn't mention that this requires titanium. So zirconosine doesn't work very well for this, but titanosine does. So you make the titanocycle as shown here. And then with electron deficient, alkyn deficient alkynes, you can displace the titanium to make pyrazines. And so it's easy to elaborate certain structures. This is a, this is a very efficient, uh, synthetically useful way to do that, I think, that uh, takes us to uh, polycyclic compounds like this with highly variable electronic properties. And these are some of the larger systems that we build up, built up using this, this kind of nitrile coupling chemistry. So I think that has a, a lot of uh, uh, possibilities for future directions. We, we are now looking at alkyne nitriles and making different rings that way. But so that's one uh, type of methodology development. Another one has to do with the Dills-Alder type of reaction. So in terms of fusing rings, uh, a, a really uh, important way to do that in the literature is to do Dills-Alder reactions of the kind you see here using furans that are uh, developed in the, in the manner shown or cyclopentadienones. Um, these reactions can be useful, but the yields aren't that great. They only work for certain uh, combinations of, of of reactants, right? But but in both of these cases, you get to a stage where you have to eliminate a group by a reduction or some other chemistry, and that can very often usually limits the yield of the Dills-Alder reaction. So uh, we had the idea to use tin in this context and actually staniline as a leaving group. And uh, this has to do with you know some background of uh, looking at silicon and tin chemistry and these kind of ring systems and looking at uh, staniline traps and generators. And so the loss of staniline from a structure like that looked like it could be a low energy process. And in fact, uh, arines react with these staniline's or stanols, I should say, these are called stanols, uh, in a very efficient way. And you can generate the stanol from a tethered diene uh, in the manner shown here, with a transmetallation of zirconium for tin. Right, so in this way, uh, you, you generate a species that reacts, reacts at very high yield with an arine uh, to do, give the dills alder product with spontaneous loss of the staniline. Okay, Harry Bergman is, uh, was a recent student that followed Gavin on this project, and uh, he, uh, extended this kind of chemistry to a lot of the uh, derivatives that, that you see here. So you see that it works in a lot of different scenarios. Uh, just to take this structure in the upper right, uh, this was made from the tetrabromide. So that middle ring uh, was used to generate a, a diene, uh, right, from the tetrabromide. And so the arides can be generated very simply in these reactions just by taking a bromide or dibromide or tetrabromide, and adding in butyl lithium. So this is the largest structure we made. This is, a, call this our lobster uh, molecule. And uh, one of the things that we noticed in this chemistry, just dealing with the stanols, is that if you just heat them on their own, 
they give cyclooctatetrines, highly substituted cyclooctatetrines. This structure is helical and chiral, pretty interesting uh, in its own right, but that is a quantitative reaction. And so that looks as though you lose the standaline, you couple the two diene units very efficiently into that eight-membered ring. Now, thinking about that chemistry and uh, what might be uh, done, uh, what, what else might be done with zirconosine coupling in the zirconocycles, we had been wondering independently whether or not copper transmetallations might give rise to cyclobutadienes. And uh, I should say that a lot of the chemistry derived for zirconosine coupling uh, is, is due to advances by Nagishi, who showed us that transmetallations to palladium, nickel, but mostly copper are very useful in then taking that fragment onto other structures. So a lot of that chemistry is done with uh, Cooper's chloride. And in one of the reports of this chemistry, uh, this result was, was reported of making a cyclooctatetraene in relatively good yield. But then the question we asked was, how does, how does that form? And does it go through cyclobutadiene? And here's another example of chemistry that you might attribute to an intermediate kind of like that. And we also had been thinking about cupric chloride uh, to do a transmetallation. You can, you can imagine that with uh, cuprous chloride, you get a dicopper species. This chemistry actually requires a mild oxidant. So why not just start with copper two? Those were questions we had about, you know, the role of copper two in maybe making a cuprous cycle, which is unknown at the time. Uh, and, uh, and so maybe just do copper dichloride. I don't know why people hadn't really looked at that, but to help stabilize this kind of a cyclobutadiene structure, we installed these bulky mesidyl groups to help do that. The question was, can we get a clean transmetallation to copper like this, and then maybe reductive elimination uh, to give a cyclobutadiene trap an intermediate that uh, is implicated in, in these other reactions. So uh, Perry did this chemistry as well. And the chemistry is that you, you can easily make the zircona cycle. Transmetallation with copper dichloride works best with pyridine around. And uh, that gives pretty high yields of the uh, copper three species that you see here. I like this is for you, it's copper three. Um, <laughs> dimer, dimeric structures like this, and you can break up the dimer uh, to give the monocopper species that you see here. Here are some crystal structures and uh, nothing really uh, that exciting about those crystal structures, but what's interesting is that these undergo clean reductive elimination to give the cyclobutadiene. And, you know, that's a quantitative reaction, starting with either copper uh, material, and so we can make the cyclobutadiene. We've looked at the kinetics of this. It's a very clean first order type reaction. It looks like a, a clean reductive elimination from copper three. Uh, and you can trap the copper one with an added uh, ligand like that. So uh, it's a nice way to make cyclobutadienes in general. And now we have an interest in using this reaction as a way to fuse a four-membered cyclobutadiene ring onto a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. And of course, this is interesting because of the anti-aromatic character of those cyclobutadienes and the interest in those kind of rings and in, in, in giving rise to low-lying uh, unpaired spin states and qubits and uh, so on, if you've uh, noticed that. literature. So here's a structure of uh, the cyclobutadiene. It has inherently a lot of anti-aromatic character just from the structure. And that has to do with the way that this phenanthrene ring enforces double bond character in that bridged uh, olefinic unit, right? So that imparts a lot of bond alternation in the cyclobutadiene. 
And, uh, and so that gives what you might call a, a prominent Jan Teller distortion. Uh, no open shell character that we can detect, uh, but, but it is highly an anti-aromatic. You can tell that, for example, by UV biz. So here I show other examples of some pretty anti-aromatic uh, cyclobutadienes and uh, their structure. This is more anti-aromatic than any that we've seen in the literature. And that, again, is because of the, the role that the phenanthrene here is playing in affecting the, the electronic structure of the four memory ring. So our interest now is turning to uh, more expanded ring systems that include this kind of uh, cyclobutadiene. Uh, some years ago, I think back in the 80s, Doherty at Caltech had some very nice theoretical papers on conjugated systems where cyclobutadienes are linked together like this and, and in polymeric form. So a lot of intriguing properties that you could possibly access in structures like that. And so we're trying to build things like this. this the student doing this is Natalie Coe. And uh, what she's found is that an attempt to make a structure like this from the tetraine that you see here, pretty easy to make, uh, she gets instead this pentaline. And we actually reported a, a way to make pentaline some years ago. And uh, so this is a uh, kind of structure that we've been uh, also familiar with. It's also interesting electronically. It has anti-aromatic character. And things like this uh, in, in recent years have been reported by Yamaguchi in Japan. This is some examples of some of those structures. This one is, is, is different from those that have been reported, I think because it has the mesidyl groups, which protect that uh, chromophore in the middle. So very distinct uh, reductions and oxidations in the, in the CV that you, you, know, you, you might imagine for a ring system like that. And uh, there's a very long absorption, I guess. It's not, yeah, it's not showing up here. I don't know why it's not showing up, but this is this. Uh, um, I don't have that data. I have, I have some for this one though. So uh, we can also link uh, cyclobutadienes by doing chemistry like you see here. This chemistry is rather sensitive to what the linking group is. So naphthol works pretty well. And this gives uh, a, a compound, a bis cyclobutadiene, that seems to have uh, a lot of anti-aromatic anti character, more so than the monomer, as indicated by the UV vis. The uh, CV, is, as you can see, is very episodic. We haven't completely uh, interpreted that yet. But the interest in systems like this is how they might uh, you know, give rise to other electronic states that could be interesting and manipulable by uh, photons. OK, uh, here's Gavin again. And one of Gavin's early results that really got us going in fused ring systems that um, we've been interested in is, is the result that you see here. This is when we were first considering what we might get out of tethered dienes. And we weren't sure how selective these reactions would be. We'd seen some selectivity going all the way back to Brett Luck's work with polymers. But uh, this little uh, oligoine, you could say, is easy to, to build from palladium coupling reactions. And if you give that uh, another zaconosine, uh, Precursor, this is our favorite. This is a compound first reported by Rosenthal, but we use it as a source of zirconosine. You easily lose the alkyne of the pyridine. This really selectively couples the neighboring uh, alkynes in the manner shown. And the really striking thing about it is that it takes a compound with no fused rings to one with 16 fused rings in one pot. And so that really piqued our interest in terms of using this kind of coupling with tethered dienes as an efficient way to build up fused ring structures in a controlled way and in a scalable way. So the yields here are 
very high. And then once you're here, you can do chemistry on the periphery of the structure uh, by doing uh, hydrolysis to, to just get now in the, uh, what should be a reactive diene, right, for uh, reactions on the periphery. We haven't followed up with that reaction chemistry so much, but we are, uh, we are interested now in helical structures like this. And uh, I can now introduce another uh, alkyne coupling reaction that we have found very useful. This zirconium chemistry is pretty novel in its high uh, quantitative yields in reactions like this and the high selectivities. It's really, I think, remarkable uh, because if you're going to do a reaction in multiple sites of a molecule like this, each, each reaction center needs to proceed in essentially quantitative yield, right? Or else you, you won't get a very good yield of, of the end product. So even though uh, these kind of couplings can be done with lots of metals across the periodic table, we really need one that's quantitative, and few of them are like that. But we found one example, and it's this iridium catalyzed 2 plus 2 plus 2 cycloaddition using a catalyst that had been reported for other such uh, cycloadditions. But it's unique to the alkyne that you see here. So it's this diether type of structure. We don't yet know why that is a preferred alkyne in this chemistry and making it essentially quantitative. But in this way, we can fuse rings and zip up a structure like this to make the same kind of helical structure that Gavin first reported uh, uh, with zirconium. And so this starting material down here, this is a really easily accessible building block that we can make in uh, 40, 50 gram scale. And so that's, a, that's a, a way to build up a lot of these helical structures and do chemistry with them. These are interesting in terms of uh, their chemistry and solution. So uh, this particular helicene uh, does this uh, self-recognition reaction, give this pi stack double 13 helix. 13 because in this case there are 13 rings in the circuit uh, of the helix. And we have a crystal structure of that one. Uh, what I didn't mention is that uh, these are the first reports of helical structures that have this open uh, space in the middle. And so we've turned the, termed those expanded helicenes. And now they're I don't know, 50 papers on expanded helicenes just since 2017. They're also interesting because of, of their potential chiral optical properties. And, uh, and that's largely why we're interested in them. So the classical helicenes that are, are really being, being pursued by many groups across the world look like this. And you can imagine expanding that structure in different ways with reactions that are very efficient at uh, introducing fused rings, laterally extended helicenes like this, or like the one shown down here. But it's really these expanded helicenes that we've been working with mostly. And uh, other groups that have now been making these use anthracene type segments directly. Uh, but the reason why this empty space here is potentially interesting is that if you can functionalize it, then you can do host gas chemistry using this chiral environment. And there are a number of reasons why these systems we think are interesting. One would be catalysis. Another would be induced chirality. And here I should mention that it's interesting to expand the structure like that, but then you run into problems with resolution of enantiomers because it's very easy for these structures to racemize, as you might imagine, because they're so open. And... Uh, so one way around that would be to add a chiral guest and lock in the chirality of the helix. And also manipulation of electronic properties. There is this uh, spin selective electron flow that has been identified by a physical chemist and established in, in several experiments. There's recently a chem review on this. But if you're not familiar with it, it's just the uh, the concept that electrons flowing through a chiral system are selected for one spin over the other. You can reverse the chirality and reverse that selectivity. And so that is an interesting way to build up spin density 
in a device, say. And so rather maybe rather than using magnets and metals to do that, we could use purely organic systems like that. But our long-term goal here is to make, in a scalable way, chiral helical uh, structures like this that we can then make then films with and test this kind of idea. Um, I'll just briefly mention that Adrian, the undergrad that we had now, now uh, in Brian Stoltz's group, worked out a way to functionalize the periphery of the smaller hel helicenes using oxidation chemistry. And then uh, introducing these uh, quinone or, or pyrazine type units really changes the stacking properties of these species. So if we're thinking about the solid state and how charges move around in uh, systems built on these kind of units, that's an important thing to keep track of and understand how, how these uh, systems pack in the solid state. And for a lot of the structures that we do, not only the helicenes, but others, we've been collaborating with Hosea Nelson. At, uh, he's now at Caltech, and he uses this microED method, which is a very powerful way to, to get crystals, crystal structures of systems that may be hard to get in a, a single crystal uh, manner. Okay, so how do you stabilize enantiomers of... Uh, of the expanded helicene. So we, we uh, collaborated with Ken Houck at, at UCLA, and uh, his group did a calculation on the barrier to uh, racemization for uh, this particular one. This is, I think, an 11 helicene. So you see the barrier is pretty low. You shouldn't be able to isolate enantiomers of that at room temperature. And so how do you get around that? Well, here, here are four different strategies. One is just elongation, just to make the helix longer and longer until it has a more difficult time unraveling. Another is to lock the ends in place like this. We've had some success doing that, and you see one example here. And the, the barrier to racemization is still too low in this case. And we measure that by NMR, by the way. All you need is diastereotopic hydrogen somewhere in the, in the helicene, and, and you can easily measure that barrier. Another one I've already mentioned is host gas chemistry to use a chiral host. And then one I haven't yet, yet mentioned is chiral induction. And that's the one that uh, we're having the most luck with. Uh, this is just uh, one uh, good example of the selectivity of that iridium coupling reaction. I didn't emphasize it earlier but you can zip up a helicene like this in the presence of other alkynes and they aren't touched in the chemistry. So it's really remarkable that the iridium doesn't trimerize the alkyne, the monoine, doesn't you know, cross-link alkynes in the structure and it just leaves other alkynes that aren't tethered alone. So we've made use of that. For example, in using, a, using an orthogonal alkyne reaction, uh, like uh, alkyne metathesis to make this figure eight uh, molecule. That's kind of locked in as well, but uh, still has a low barrier to racemization. Okay, it crystallizes in, uh, in uh, chiral form. So I'm gonna go past that and get to the strategy of elongation. And uh, this is probably Gavin's nicest piece of work on this project. The idea is to take uh, a structure that uh, results from iridium coupling to close up uh, a small helicene like this, but leaving functional groups on the end that can be used for coupling reactions. And the key is that, that this iridium catalysis tolerates peripheral alkynes. So these are, are not affected by that coupling. And then we need to do chemistry to allow us to couple, say, this 11 helicene into a longer helicene that we can then zip up using that same iridium catalysis, but now with these alkynes, which then become tethered, right, once we do that coupling. So how do we do that? To do that in a controlled way, what we needed to do is desymmetrize this dibromide. And that is pretty hard to do because they're not electronically uh, coupled in, in any way. 
And so in thinking about that, we thought, well, let's use palladium uh, and do an oxidative addition. And that could take up just enough room to only go once. And that works beautifully. So the palladium allows us to desymmetrize. We can then use uh, an aluminum hydride, take off the palladium, stoichiometric and palladium. But it gives us this monobromide in pretty decent yield. From there, Gavin was able to trimerize or uh, at least do a coupling reaction, rather like the one I indicated, the reagents are a little bit different. But after the final uh, tethered alkyne coupling, he was able to make this 23 helicene, so 23 rings in, in the circuit. At the time, seven rings longer than any known carbohelicene like this. This is a fast moving area. So there are a few that, that are longer that have been reported, but not in this kind of yield. This is scalable chemistry that you can do in very high yield. So this helicene now is stable enough in enantiomeric forms that you can do a separation on a chiral column. Uh, this was done uh, for us by Colin Knuckles group. Uh, we don't have a chiral HPLC. Uh, but they do, and then we can uh, investigate the chiral optical properties. And the dissymmetry factor associated with this 23 helicene is uh, two times better than what had been reported for any helicene up, up to this point. And calculations indicate that this has to do with magnetic dipole moment and the diameter of the helical structure. So that gives us uh, some guiding principles in, in doing some of this chemistry further and making chiral structures like this. Here's the x-ray structure. We did get a single crystal x-ray structure of that particular helicene. So just briefly, uh, August Rottenberger, who's, who's now taken up this project, is, is looking at chiral induction. And so he's been able to append chiral groups to the end of the helicene in the way that you see here. And in some cases, he gets pretty high diastereomeric ratios. And furthermore, those diastereomeric ratios, which you see up here as a function of uh, the amine, it's added to do the uh, form the imine, uh, give pretty pretty good uh, dissymmetry factors and we can make thin films, and we're now starting to study these. This we see as, as the, the most um, productive route to looking at chiral uh, helicene films like this because this the chemistry here is just easier to do. Okay. So I want to turn back to uh, using the, the dynamic covalent chemistry that I mentioned earlier. And this just outlines some of the guiding principles that we developed over the years. One is that if the linker is bent in any way, then you tend to get a, a dimer, a uh, coupling of two dienes. And uh, that actually happens if you make just a, a paraphenylene linker long enough. It can bend back on itself and give this rather large molecule. This was made by Jonathan Nitschke. I mean, he was a student in the group, so he developed that. And a synthesis of, of the uh, these long uh, paraphenylene oligomers. If the linker is rigid and, and uh, not flexible, then you tend to get a, a triangle like this. And Jonathan also made this particular one uh, that has three benzenes as, as a guest. You can also do this in three, three dimensions. I'll come back to that. But one of the things that, that we think is interesting in terms of having a high yielding macrocyclization that we can use is to orient chromophores in a macrocycle in different ways to interrogate their interactions. So we did that in the context of singlet fission, where we were able to pretty easily install pentacenes into macrocycles that were either dimeric, and that's because of the biphenyl linkers that can bend a little bit, or trimeric, and that's because these units are locked into phenanthrene type units like this, 
And so we were able to measure the rates of, of singlet fission in those cases. And I won't say a lot more about that. The paper has been published. But in terms of uh, challenges that you can think about, in terms of macrocycles and what you can do with ring fusions, in micro, macrocyclizations, we began to think about the most challenging problems out there in this area. And uh, fused macrocycles are, are challenging synthetic targets, but very interesting in, for a number of reasons. And there are a number of them that you could consider, you know, flat ones like this that are related to keculene and, and, and structures like that, or maybe uh, somewhat uh, bent ones all the way over to nano belts like this. So there's a continuum of curvature that takes us from one kind to the other. All of these are based on fused rings. And uh, once you start to curve, then you're going to introduce some strain. By the time you get to a nano belt, that's a lot of strain, right? So these should have unusual properties in terms of uh, host gas chemistry. Interesting electronic behavior. They're porous, so interesting maybe as building blocks. And so lots of reasons uh, to, to try to target them. And synthetically, they're a challenge, right? So that's another reason to target them. Um, there are very few ways to, to make carbon-carbon bonds to form macrocycles like this, and the ring fusions introduce uh, some selectivity uh, issues and also strain building. So nano belts were first propo proposed a long time ago, 1954. I think that's the year Pete was born. That so was a good year. And... Uh, in, in uh, over many years, uh, attempts to make these, uh, you know, did not succeed. And then nanotubes were reported in 1991. So it wasn't until 2017 that the first nano belt was synthesized. And these have mostly been made by two groups, the Atami group in Japan and uh, the Miao group in China. And in the few examples they have reported, uh, every type of, of nanotube in structure has been accessed in a nano belt. Uh, and you see what those are here and, uh, and how, they, how they correspond to a piece of a nanotube. So these syntheses are challenging and inherently low yielding. And that's because you have to build in a lot of strain. So inherently, these groups are using coupling reactions like the Yamamoto coupling here, that introduces a lot, a lot of, of strain and you lose a lot of degrees of freedom in one reaction. So of course the yield is going to be very low. Here a Scholl reaction is used uh, for doing that. And that's why the yields of, of these species have been less than 3% and only milligrams of, of each have been made. So we thought that we could use the ring fusions and the macrocyclizations in a productive way to make a nano belt. And this is the work of Harry, All right? So this is how Atami uh, does it. And we thought, well, let's build up a lot of the ring fusion first where we wouldn't be introducing strain, then come in with a macrocyclization where we only have to do, introduce a couple of more rings, finish off the structure. So that was the idea. And this is uh, in practice, the ring system that uh, Harry built up. The idea is to go use the iridium coupling to give the fused ring monomeric diene that you see here and fuse that. And uh, here's actually how it happened. So that, I showed you the theory. This is uh, how this works. We can make two grams of that material. And then there's a conosine coupling works very nicely and in decent yield. You have the macrocycle that you see here. And luckily, the bromides that, that right along are sin and oriented in just the right way uh, to couple to, to fuse rings. And so some of the NMR data is shown there. So that works in the end to give us uh, about almost half a gram of this nano belt. So we finish off with a... a well, we have a Dills-Alder reaction. I should note here, this Dills-Alder reaction allows us to introduce different functional groups 
on two sides of, of the nano belt. And then here is a crystal structure. That's not such a great crystal structure, but when we change to T-butyl groups in the alkyne, uh, then we get good, better crystal data. And that data is shown here. This, is, uh, this, this nano belt has a high aspect ratio. So it represents a slice through the uh, nanotube that's pretty angled. You see some of the parameters here. Um, and so this, uh, here's the aspect ratio here. As you, as you see, it's uh, sliced through at, that's very angled. But the, the method should work for lots of different uh, types of nano belts. And in fact, some of the other ones that I, that I showed. A couple of other things about the nano belt. If you look down the C axis of the crystals, it looks like you have channels that run through the nano belts. And the nano belts are lining up in the crystal as if they want to form a nanotube in just this way. So introdu introducing the right functional groups on the ends uh, may give us some interesting chemistry along the lines of making extended materials. post guess chemistry we could do because with uh, this synthesis, we had enough of material to do that. These are very good guess for uh, electron-rich conjugated molecules like you see here. And in this paper, we, we, we reported uh, some of that data. Last topic uh, I'd like to introduce goes back to the dynamic covalent chemistry and things that we can do with that. So it's a way to think about expanding the structures we're making from macrocycles into three dimensions, into cages and more elaborate structures like that, and uh, maybe even highly entangled structures that have unusual topologies. And we've become very interested in that because of, of some of the results I'll show you. But uh, a key uh, thing to think about, I think, is that topology controls a lot of what we as humans have, have done over the years in, in terms of developing materials on the macro scale for our purposes. Knotting and weaving are prime examples of that, but uh, extending these ideas to the molecular scale is a bit challenging. So how would you knot up things like that or, or interweave them? I think this is uh, uh, an area that's in its infancy, infancy, and we need some, some breakthroughs to learn how to do that. So we're, we in particular are interested in looking at new topologies and knotting in nanocarbon type structures that have fused rings uh, that uh, build up electronic properties, that in principle will make things more challenging because there are limited ways to make carbon-carbon bonds in a controlled way. And uh, nonetheless, this has been done by, by some really great work by the groups that you see down here. Jasty is at Oregon and he has this three catenane where he's got one uh, big uh, macrocycle that is, is looping through two smaller ones. There's a trefoil knot that's been reported by Atami and this link type system by Kong. So the way to approach this uh, uh, by the structures that I just showed you is by templating. That's how those structures by Jasti and Atami and Kong were made. Uh, you have to use templating in some way by metal coordination, or yeah, there are other ways to do it. But basically, you have to bring things together and force them to orient in such a way that a subsequent coupling will give the, the desired product. However, invariably, in this chemistry, there are places where the coupling can go wrong, and there's no way to do error correction, whereas dynamic covalent chemistry opens up that possibility. In this case, we're driven to the product by reversible reactions and uh, error correction. So if, if, if things start off wrong, that can be corrected. And as long as, as uh, the, the targeted structure is the entropically favored one, you can drive all the way to that uh, particular structure. So that's, that's the simple idea. Uh, a key comparison here is, here's the Tommy's trefoil and uh, the, the yield there is 0.3%. And Zhang at Colorado has been using dynamic covalent chemistry in alkyne metathesis. 
And there are a number of things you can do with alkyne metathesis like this, but he's made this interesting interlocked cage, which we think is the first example of a particular class of knotted structures like that. The way we've approached this, it, uh, for the most part recently, is with tritopic triines that have the basic structure here. It's highly modular. We have a, a C3 type core that can be used to control, for example, pi stacking between these units. Uh, for example, with a, the triazine that you see here, uh, the linkers we can change. And the people that have been working on this are Harry, August, I've already mentioned, and Angela Fan was an undergrad who now is at UCSD. So this is a result that uh, August obtained using pretty short linkers and the triazine. And this gives a, a polyhedral cage, a tetrameric cage. It's a very efficient way to make this kind of cage. The dynamic covalent chemistry drives you to the cage-like structure with zirconium, add HCl, and you get uh, a pure carbon-based cage. And this is the crystal structure. Other people have made four plus six types of polyhedral cages. And uh, well, here's a mapping of the cage. It's pretty simple, low level of complexity. Um, and here are some which feature the divalent covalent chemistries that are mainly used in supramolecular chemistry. So uh, one is metal ligand coordination. So Vegeta has done that. So he's made a tetrameric cage in that way. And then a lot of people use this imine formation to do that. And uh, uh, cages of those types have, have been used as well. The difference I'll point out is that these dynamic covalent chemistries do not lock in the structure into a stable structure, right? So this is an all carbon based cage, whereas uh, imines can hydrolyze and metal ligands can, bonds can of course be broken. Okay, so the next uh, result we had in this direction came from elongating the linker a little bit, introducing a bending angle of about 150 degrees. That's just because a thiophene is here. And this coupling is pretty high yielding. So we, we put a butyl group in here on the silyl group to solubilize things. It doesn't do anything else. Still gives rise to the reversible coupling. And this gives us this triply interlocked catenate. It has the same mapping out as the Zhang structure that I showed you. Here's a crystal structure, obviously dominated by the pi interactions of the core, which, uh, help assemble that structure. So you can see those pi interactions uh, in their molecular pi interactions in the solid state. And you can, you can look at the monomer in solution and see that it actually is forming a dimer in a monomer dimer type of equilibrium. Then you add the zirconocene and it you know, zips up into that structure. So this is a way to map it out that it illustrates the, the pi stacking but in terms of links and the catenane type components, that is the threading that's there, it maps out in this way, right? So uh, multiple threading types of interactions there. So then the question was, okay, what if we turn off the pi stacking? So the, the triazine, triazine is giving us that. What if we just use a, a, a triphenylene like this? Do we get the same kind of structure or do we get a larger, more complex structure? And the answer is that we don't get that same structure, but rather we get a hexameric structure, which has a fairly complicated interwoven structure. And uh, it's, a, it's a little hard to deconvolute by just looking at the rotating diagram or static one. But one way to think about it and describe it is that it has trefoil components, but it's knotted into what you might refer to as a four catenate. Okay, if we map it out in terms of, in a way that emphasizes the threading, then we get a structure like this. It looks a lot like the, the one I showed you previously, but it's one step up in complexity. And, uh, 
think uh, on the next slide, I have a couple of other ways to think about it. There's uh, a trefoil that you can map out uh, for this structure, but also a trefoil that's threaded like this. Uh, there are actually two trefoils that map out that have different chirality. So overall, the structure is not chiral. But what's unique about this is that in topology is that it's interwoven and interlocked. And we don't think those two things are um, present in other, other uh, topologies and molecules like this. So uh, we have concluded that there is a class of similarly interwoven, interlocked uh, topologies that are based on related links. And so the first one we talked about is, is, is like a, a link where the crossing points in the link are replaced by, by catenane or threaded type structures. And you can do the same with the trefoil and presumably up to higher and higher uh, complexities from links to these structures, which we have termed, termed perplexanes. Now, Harry came up with this term perplexane and I didn't like it at first because, you know, it just sounds like you can't really comprehend the structure, which is true at first. <laughs> but actually, perplexus is Latin for an entanglement. So I think in, in that light, and because it's an easily easy to remember term, I think we're going to try to, to uh, keep using it. Well, uh, I, I, I don't think I have a conclusion slide, but in the interest of time, I think I'll wrap up and uh, thank the people who have been involved in this work. Here are uh, the more recent people who have been working on what we call nanocarbons. But I told you about how Shane Mao jumped on this project. And we talk a lot of, about a lot of things in group meetings, but it's really unusual that somebody would really uh, pick up on something and run with it the way Shane did. And so over here, I, I just list a number of people who have added to the project over the years. And you, you might recognize some of the names, some pretty talented people, Jonathan Nitschke, who got interested in supermolecular chemistry and now is at, at Cambridge doing very well in that area, Laurel Schaefer, uh, Sam Johnson, uh, Victoria Gessner. So I want to thank all of them and the collaborators that we've uh, been lucky enough to, uh, to work with. And you for your attention and, and uh, allowing me to come, to come to Cornell and have such an entertaining two days here. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? So the perplexanes look a bit like units of chain mail, you could say, and you're getting them in quite high yield. So I'm wondering if there's a way that uh, the group is working towards taking these small interlocked units and finding a way to template several of these different ones together to create sort of a fence, if you will. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the interest in entanglement and topology now is in terms of materials that might derive uh, from having those units in them. I think my colleague Omar Yagi might have reported an entangled moth. Um, and uh, I think there was a DARPA call for, uh, you know, new chemical ways to make, you know, mechanically, mechanically interlocked molecules as, as they call them. Uh, so that is something we're thinking about. And in terms of, of connecting these, the silyl groups are, are good places to start. Uh, we know that we can put vinylic groups there on the silo group, so we can have a vinyl in each of those positions. So that is a starting point for functionalization. We know that the zirconosine coupling is um, tolerates aryl halides. So we, we discovered that, that in the in some of the polymer chemistry that we do. So we can have aryl bromides, fluorides, whatever, uh, as reaction points in the link. I think there are ways to do that. And uh, yeah, uh, that, that's a thing to do. Uh, there's another thing that ever Dialkites would do, going back to the beginning of your story, 
and that is the du Bergman type chemistry, where you form a diuretical by not forming a central bond. Do you ever see any Bergman type chemistry? Uh, so that is with an ene dione, right? That's with an ene dione, but say yes. so you take a, a diene dione like you have, uh -huh. diene dione. Now to drive it toward Bergman chemistry, you need to make an aromatic eight-membered ring. So you uh -huh. two plus or two minus. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I think Joe O'Connor at UCSD tried to, to do a metal initiated Bergman cyclization. I don't remember the result of that. It should be possible. Um, Steve Buckwald, back when he was doing zirconosine coupling, tried uh, coupling a, a one, two diene on a benzene ring, you know, with si silo groups. And what he saw was incomplete coupling there. But I don't know that anybody has ever looked at the right kind of uh, endione with zirconosine. So the right endione would have silyl groups maybe on the end um, or other functionalization. But that's a great idea, especially in terms of uh, introducing some of the uh, electronically interesting fragments I would, uh, was talking about. I'm going to think more about that. Uh, for your transmetallation to the copper, do you have to have all the zirconosine um, basically that reaction completed before adding in the copper, or can you have the copper in initially kind of use zirconosine kind of catalytically? Well, there's nothing catalytic about it. Uh, it we can generate the, the zircona cycle in situ and then add the copper. But then after the transmetallation, maybe not returning at three. What's the phase of the zirconosine after the transmetallation? Zirconosine dichloride. Okay. And then try it. Can you reduce that or is that just too much? You know, Laurel Schaefer and I started talking about ways to make this kind of thing catalytic years ago. And it's just taken a long time to eventually come to this iridium system, which is catalytic, but that's a two plus two plus two. Um, making the zirconium one catalytic will be difficult, especially if you have chlorides and, and you're using those to take the zirconium out. But uh, maybe with titanium in the reaction I showed where you can displace the titanosine with an alkyne to make a pyrazine, I think that might be the basis of a, maybe a, a catalytic way to do something like that. Uh, any other questions? So um, over time, I found that at various tables in my house, you know, one of the legs will get a little bit shorter or bent. <laughs> I've used plaques like this. In this case, it's... Uh, I saw some of those in your office. <laughs> so, from Berkeley, actually. <laughs> so, so you stole our idea, huh? <laughs> So, you know, uh, on those occasions, I use one of these. <laughs> I'm sure, Don, you will find great use. Oh, for this. so let's thank Don again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Al's going to have some light in his office. But okay. Well, yeah, I remember I was there in was there in ninety seven. Yeah.